for a couple of days on Minnesota. It's going to tell us about an emergency on Ionic Sea. Uh, all right. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for letting me come here. Uh, it's been a ton of fun so far. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so today I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, something called large and volume independence, which I suspect most of you have heard. It's not a very widely known thing, but also better than talking, you'll know what I mean by that. And I'm going to tell you about an implication that it apparently has, which is very striking, which is that there should be an emergent fermionic symmetry in a theory which does not have supersymmetry. Um, this is. Uh, Work, uh, some published work uh, done with Goksha Basar, Daniel uh, Dorigoni, and Mita Tunsal, as well as some other work. Okay, so let me start with some, with some motivation, okay? So this talk is going to be about large engaged theories. And if, one question you might wonder is uh, why, why should you care, okay? The real world is PCD with three colors, why should you care about Larga? Okay? Well, the issue is that, well, the reason you should care about QCD is that it underlies, for instance, all of nuclear physics. It's a very important theory for understanding the world. Okay? But despite 40 years of efforts, any attempt at an analytic solution with UCD has been far out of reach. Okay? There are no obvious expansions in the theory, and that causes us a lot of problems in using any of the tools that we have that are analytic. Okay? Now, <clears throat> already in 1973, Atul pointed out that QCD actually has a very not obvious expansion parameter, which is the number of colors in this theory. So if you view the number of colors as an adjustable parameter, and then go to the num limit where the number of colors is large, the large end limit, and then expand the one over n, you get some control over the theory. Okay? So it's a, the, the theory simplifies dramatically, and even though there's still no analog solution at large end, nevertheless, there are a lot of qualitative and even some qu quantitative insights you get from studying large end limits. Well, gauge theory, in particular, large end limits. <clears throat> so, what does QCD of large n look like? So it looks like a nuclear couple ring of an infinite number of stable hadrons, that is, things like mesons and blue balls. Okay? Um, these hadrons um, have a Hagedorn density of states. So if you look at the number of hadronic states up to uh, some given energy, as you take that energy to be large, the number of states grows exponentially. Hagedorn density of states means, I'll say more about that later in the talk, but if you stare at these features, Okay? Infinite number of excitations with a Hagedorn density of states. That smells like some kind of string theory. And indeed, for more than 30 years, it's been believed that the large unlimits of gauge theories are some kind of string theories. Now, much more recently, it was understood that some large gauge theories have an amazing feature, which is called large and volume. <coughs> it's not true for all gauge theories, but only for some. But it turns out that if you ask that this feature be consistent with these properties, in particular with the Hagedorn density of states, you reach a very strange conclusion. You conclude that uh, you, you, you have to have an emergent fermionic symmetry that lies at large end, um, which cannot be supersymmetry, which has to go beyond what we normally think of as supersymmetry. Okay? So this will have to happen in theories where there are more fermionic degrees of freedom than bosonic ones. It can't be supersymmetry. Okay? And before I continue, there's probably a question, why isn't this ridiculous? Okay? After all, we all know from the Colin Mandela theorem and its extension of the Petronas-Kitsonius theorem <coughs> that SUSY is the only non-trivial extension of the Poincaré algebra uh, of symmetries for the S matrix of a relativistic quantum field theory. Okay? So, naively, if you take a theory that has, I'll tell you what this one is in a second, which has more fermions and bosons, uh, you can't have SUSY. So how could anything have a symmetry which is who goes beyond supersymmetry in view of this theorem? Can you tell us just a little bit more about this fermionic symmetry? First of all, it's rigid. Yes, it's global. It's global. Is, is the parameter it's been hack parameter? It's been hack. It would have okay. to be a spin hack parameter. Okay. Okay. You'll see why later in the talk, but it would okay. have to be a spin okay. hack parameter. Okay. That's right. And I have in mind rigid, not, not global. Okay. Um, now, the reason that such an idea what I'm advocating here, does not obviously conflict with these theorems, is that at the at infinite end, the S matrix of large engagements is trivial. These theories constrain the S matrix, but it's not there at large end. Okay? So they don't actually apply to the large and limited gauge theories. And we're, so extra emergent fermionic, sorry, extra emergent symmetries can easily emerge at large end. And we're not the first ones to notice this. For instance, very recently, Mal Basin and Jiguera uh, discussed exactly that kind of thing in the context of Paris which naively would be ruled out by Colomangela, but 
they're working about drugs, so there's no problem. I excuse me. Yeah. If you have a trivial S matrix, then you have then you have also trivial symmetry. I mean then you have, everything is a symmetry. Uh, depends. So a free theory has lots of symmetry, but it doesn't have any possible symmetry you can write. It depends. Okay? So it depends on the structure of the free theory. Okay, and, and free, by free I mean the the, 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 the physical degrees of freedom. The, the mesons and blue balls, I don't mean the quarks now. Composite states. The, the composite the states. Non trivial sorry. dynamics. No, 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 I would say it differently. The yeah. mesons and glue balls, they become free at large end. They're the physical states. But the microscopic degrees of freedom, the quarks and the gluons, they are strongly interacting. So the physical degrees of freedom become free, not, not, not the microscopic structure. Hold those thoughts, okay? Obviously, you're, you're getting at something important, but nevertheless. A symmetry would mean the symmetry of those matrices or symmetry of the non Yes, by a symmetry, I mean a symmetry of the or, or that of the of the pattern. Okay. So okay. But so what I'm trying to say is that emergent symmetries are certainly not forbidden at large end. Emergent symmetries are a little beyond what Kolmogorov said you could have. However, just you know, there's no particular reason to look for them either. And the point is that, as you'll see, thinking about volume independence and Hagedorn behavior of large gauge trees tells you that you should look for emergent fermionic symmetries. In some classes. Just but which volume are you referring to here? Volume. Volume. Uh, yeah. Space time volume. Space time. Space time. Oh, okay. So you so will really see, yeah, that's right. What I mean is compactifying the theory. Uh -huh. And it turns out it doesn't see that it's compactified in a certain sense, which will become clear later. Okay? So the the star of the show during this talk is going to be a theory called UCD adjoint. So let me tell you what that is. So it's an SUN gauge theory with NF massless adjoint wild what you call a marron, because there, it's a real representation. So why should you care about this particular random non-supersymmetric theory? Um, well, there's actually a really good reason. If you work on R4, okay, which is where you would normally want to work, okay, this funny-looking theory is actually intimately related to large and QCD by something called the orbital of the orientable equivalence. So to be slightly more precise, it turns out that at large end, there's a set of operators, uh, color singlet operators, in QCD adjoint, whose correlation functions agree precisely up to 1 over n corrections with corresponding operators in another theory, which is SU, SU and gauge theory, with two index antisymmetric cores. Okay? Now, at that point, you might still say, who cares? One theory I don't care about related to another theory I don't care about. But this one is actually really important, because this one, when you set n to 3, it becomes QCD. To say it another way, this theory is the large end limit of QCD. It's one of the possible large end limits of QCD. So that means that there's a large end connection between the theory I'll be talking about and actual large end QCD. So whatever we learn about this theory may tell us important things about actual QCD. Okay? So this is actually not a random theory that we're going to talk about, even though it may look like it. You mean pure QCD, no matter of coupling. No, with matter. With matter. matter. QCD with matter. Okay. With quarks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay? And no scalars. Okay. <clears throat> so during the talk, I'm going to have in mind what people usually refer to as the total large end limit. The total large end limit consists of sending number of colors to infinity while holding something called the total coupling, g squared times n fixed. And you also hold the number of flavors fixed. Okay. And in my case, the flavors are, are have two indices, two color indices. Now, the resulting theory is still very strongly coupled in terms of quarks and gluons. Okay? Um, remains asymptotically free and so on and so forth. <clears throat> However, you can show that the mesons and glue balls only interact weakly. So the physical degrees of freedom are weakly. <clears throat> Unlike the microscopic degrees of freedom. And, for instance, the, uh, the kind of amplitude that, that would be relevant for considering decay of a Hadron, like a meson or a blue ball. Hadron, H here stands for hadron. It goes like 1 over n. Uh, 2 to 2 scattering amplitudes, well, diagonals of each of them go like 1 over n squared. Uh, loops are suppressed and so on. So it becomes like a classical theory in terms of the physical degrees of freedom. Good luck actually finding them explicitly. But at least in terms of physical degrees of freedom, that's what it looks like. Okay? So it turns out that these kinds of simplifications are behind both the phenomenon of well, having a Hagedorn or density of states, and also behind this volume of which I'll tell you about next. So why do you say that the 
strong coupling in terms of quarks and gluons. I mean, little g can be small. You can be coupling in. Uh, it's small, but it runs. So it's still. Ah, okay. I mean, it's it's still it's still asymptotically free, mm -hmm. and it's still strongly. Well, it's still strongly coupled in terms of quarks and gluons at low energies. Yeah. The point that I'm making is, in terms of the physical exit freedom, mm -hmm. it's, it's just weakly coupled. Period. Mm -hmm. But that's not true if you just try to directly work. With it's the QCD scale essentially. Exactly. The there's still a, there's still an angle of QCD. In fact, mm -hmm. setting this fixed fixes the QCD scale. Mm -hmm. Holds that fixed as you take the large Good. Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you guys are asking questions. It's great. Um, okay. So before I tell you about Hagedorn densities of states, which many people may have heard about if you think about string theory. Let me tell you about volume independence, which I think is less well known. So this thing called volume independence was discovered quite a long time ago by some string theorists, actually, Wu Xing in 1982. Okay? Um, so in the in the setting in which they were working, they were thinking about just pure SU and gauge theory. Okay? And in fact, even though they're string theorists now, back then they were thinking about lattice gauge theory, but that doesn't really count. Okay? So they take pure SU and gauge theory and compactify it, let's say, down to R3 times a circle. Okay, so you compactify one of the directions. And let's say the circle has size L. So when you do this in gauge theory, it is known that you pick up uh, a global symmetry, which is a topological symmetry. So it's there when you compactify it like this, but it's not there otherwise, which is called the Z n center symmetry. This Z n center symmetry, global symmetry, it acts like, like this. So if you have a compact direction circle, you can wrap a Wilson loop around. So you can have a holonomy that looks like that. Okay? So traces of powers of this holonomy are gauge invariant. So they're gauge invariant observables in the theory. And under the center symmetry, they transform as follows. They transform by multiplication by roots of unity, the nth roots of unity. Okay? So the expectation values of these operators uh, parameterize which phase you're in. So they're order parameters for the realization of the center symmetry. If all of these traces vanish, the center symmetry is preserved. If some trace of, of the trace of some power of, of, of omega uh, doesn't vanish. The symmetry is broken. It's a global symmetry. It can break or not break the things on the dynamics. So what these guys proved, okay, is that if this center symmetry is not spontaneously broken, it is preserved. Then there is no volume dependence, volume being L, in connected correlators of topologically trivial single trace operators up to one. Think about what that means. It means that you compactify the theory, okay, but a broad class of observables don't know that you compactify it. They don't see the L. Okay? A particular implication of it is that there are no phase transitions in this theory as a function of L, at least as long as L doesn't scale with it. But previously you told us the volume was space time volume. Now no, I'm, I'm saying volume. space volume, space volume. I shouldn't say space time. It's a space there. And even then, by space, you mean just a compact by circle, not yeah. the free space. Kind of. Is this Euclidianized theory? Uh, you, could, you could, OK, so the way I wrote it is Euclidianized. If you want, it's R12 times S1. Okay. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So during my talk, actually, for the most part, I'll be thinking about it as Euclidean, but you know, we can always book rotate. And I'm always going to envision this circle as being a spatial circle, as it happens. But that's the subtlety that we'll come to later, which is actually important. So, so you can just make trivial. So this expectation value must vanish. Is that the argument now? So it, well, it if doesn't have to vanish. No. It's a dynamical question about mm -hmm. the theory. Right? Symmetry realization depends on the dynamics and depends on the particular theory you work with. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, if it vanishes, mm -hmm. then that symmetry is preserved. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't vanish, then it's broken. In other words, this is an order parameter. Mm -hmm. well, trace of omega and trace of mm -hmm. omega squared and so on. They are order parameters for the okay. realization of this and if they all vanish, if the theory doesn't the know about it. Yeah. And if they all vanish in the, at large n, mm. you get this bizarre result. Because the only L dependence would be through those operators, roughly speaking. How do you know that? Roughly. Hold, hold on, it's coming. Okay? Please, it's mm. sense. Okay, hold on. Okay? Now, what I want to say is that this sounds may sound great, if you believe it, but it also sounds very surprising. Um, I mean, how can a theory not know you compactify it? That's weird. But supposing that it's true, you can envision all kinds of applications. For instance, you can reduce four-dimensional Lang-Mills theory to some kind of low-dimensional model, and maybe you can solve it easily. Okay? So it sounds potentially useful. So given that it sounds kind of interesting and potentially useful, there are two questions. One, how does it work? Why is this true? And two, why doesn't everybody know about it? Why is it not in all the textbooks? 
So there's reasons. Oh, oh wait, even if it were true, if it were, if it were true only up to one of n, yeah. and not uh, subleading corrections, yeah. still not good enough to reduce a dimension to well, one lower, right? Would it be strong enough? Would, would it, it be still be, uh, would be surprised? Able to, uh, it, would, it would be surprised. Why, why should a large n theory not know when it's compact? Right? It's still not obvious. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, it is to me, but only because I've thought about it for about four years. But, I mean, but you would lose a dimension only if n is strictly infinite, not otherwise. Uh, correct. Yeah, sure. But the point is that mm. you envision doing a one over n expansion, and mm. to the extent that, to the extent that a third or a ninth, depending on what you think about the expansion being one over n or one over n squared, to the extent that's a small number, then the infinite n information is already close to what you want in the real world. So that's a question will depend on the theory and the observable and so on. But we know that in many cases it is actually. Pretty so that's, that's what I have in mind. Also, you do string theory, so you're always thinking about where that was. Yeah. Just I'm going to comment. There was work to Hoof did in the 70s on some area sure. operator, Wilson loop. There's something similar. Yes, 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 yes. So, the, so, so yes, the, the, there is work uh, that's related, but uh, since I, I didn't cite it in the talk because mm. there's not enough time in the talk to cite everything. Yes. So, but Hoof didn't, didn't, didn't notice this. It mm -hmm. was noticed a little bit. Okay, so first, let me tell you how it works, and then let me tell you why it's not in the textbooks. There's a good reason why it's not in the textbooks. So, first, let's talk about volume dependence, okay, which is the normal situation. You compactify a theory, it certainly knows you compactify it. Okay, so let's take a scalar field theory on R3 times S1. Let's say a scalar 5 4 theory for the sake of argument. Okay, and let's say you put periodic boundary conditions on this circle. Again, for the sake of argument, you could do whatever you want about it. Then you expand the fields in Fourier modes on the circle, and you get the Kikei spectrum. Right? It's basic quantum field theory. So the spectrum is spaced in levels of 2 pi over 1, essentially. Okay? So the theory most certainly sees the finiteness of the circle. Right? It gives you a finite spacing of modes. So in, in the limit that the circle size goes to infinity, this becomes a continuum. Okay? That's where the, the, the so in, in that limit, for sure, because you have a continuum of, of, of excitations, it's as if you had an infinite, uh, infinite volume. But when the when L is finite, the theory certainly knows it's finite. Okay. Um, now it turns out that gauge theories on a circle are much more subtle than this. This is not quite how they behave, as it turns out. Okay? At least not in general. Okay. So the key is this center symmetry that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So again, now let's take the SU engaged theory on a circle, a circumference L, and put periodic boundary conditions for all the fields in the problem. Then, let's say for the sake of argument that the circle size is small, okay? so that I can talk about things perturbatively. So if the circle size is small, then the coupling uh, is going to be set at the scale L, and by asymptotic freedom, if L is very tiny, you're going to get good coupling, so I can do calculations, at least in principle. So then, the physics of what happens is going to depend on the VEV of uh, trace of omega and its powers. Omega is the most rapid circle. Now, because omega is a unitary matrix, in fact, it's an SUN, its eigenvalues, which are the thing that's going to control the trace, have to lie in a unit circle. It's not the same circle as your compactified on some other abstract circle. Okay? So the question is, what's the eigenvalue distribution of omega? Okay? That's what's going to control what the center symmetry is preserved or broken. So one possibility is that all of the eigenvalues are clumped at one spot. Okay? That means that when you take the trace, uh, you're going to get something that's not zero. That's a central broken case. Another possibility in the SUN case is that the eigenvalues are going to come at the nth roots of unity. Then if you take the trace, the sum of the nth roots of unity is zero. Okay? That's a centric symmetry predict. And of course, there are intermediate possibilities, but these are the two that I want to consider. They're the most interesting ones for me. Okay? So now, um, the thing is that a expectation value for omega means an expectation value for the gauge field in the compact direction. But an expectation value for the gauge field in the compact direction has interpretation of it's, it leads to an adjoint Higgs mechanism. You see, a gauge field transforms essentially as an adjoint scalar field. And so an expectation value for, for a gauge field will, will, uh, will, will lead to an adjoint phase mechanism. Okay? So then, you can ask, 
Um, in these two different cases, we have a broken center or a preserved center. What is the spectral excitations of the theory? Okay? And what you, should, what, what you find is that the, the spectrum of, uh, for instance, W bosons, okay, um, in the case when the center symmetry is preserved, looks like this. It's 2 pi divided by nL times some integer. Okay? The n comes because the spacing here is set by n, rather by 1 over n. They're evenly distributed around the new circle, and they're n of them. <coughs> okay? if, if all of them were come to the same space, spot, that would translate to a zero bet for, for the gauge field, and there's no adjoint phase mechanism, and the spacing is the same one you would have seen in the pure scalar theory, which is just in units of 1 over n. So there's a key difference between having a center symmetric background for the gauge field, in which case the spacing of modes is 1 over nl, and having a uh, such a broken phase in which the spacing is 1 over l. Okay? So, let's continue. Now, suppose that you decide to fix the product n times l, okay? so it doesn't scale with n. Okay? Then the theory will become weakly coupled in the infrared, and it, this is not the regime that I'm going to be talking about for most of the talk, but it's nevertheless interesting because it gives you a theorist-friendly deformation of asymptotic deep field theories on R4 with physics that becomes smoothly connected to the large volume limit. And this kind of idea of working with this kind of center symmetric phase or finding theories in which it, this is the right phase and studying it carefully, it, this is a key tool in some recent progress in the understanding of the origin of mass gaps in some asymptotic deep field theories, cancellation of normal ambiguities, and other things, which I can talk about offline if you'd like to. And that. Okay? But for this talk, that's not the regime I'm interested in. I want to work with the twelfth large element, where the only thing I take to infinity is n. Okay? I don't, I don't uh, change the size of L with n at all. Okay? So if L is fixed and n goes to infinity, look at this. Okay? So if n goes to infinity first, this becomes a continuum. Okay? So no matter how small L is, this is a continuum, so long as n is taken to infinity first. And so it looks like an extra dimension has emerged somehow out of the colors. And this is not just an accident, it's not just something that happens in the picture. In fact, David Dross and, and, and Kitazawa, in the mid 80s, after the work of Eguchi and Kawai, found an understanding of it um, by mapping color sums and planar diagrams onto momentum sums. So that there's a one to one mapping between them. So, so long as you're in a central symmetric phase, magic happens. Okay? This information about the behavior of the theory as a function of momentum in some compact direction is mapped into what's going on in the color of user freedom. So you can make the circle size very small, and the theory doesn't know it because if you're at large n, all the information is in the color anyway. Okay? So this is large n volume of the Okay. Um, let me mention, since this is a screen theory heavy audience, let me mention another route to seeing volume of the which is based on an idea called orbital. So orbifold projections are an idea that was born in string theory in the late 90s, in the work of Kachuru and Silverstein. And it turned out that eventually, while it was born in string theory, actually had a perfectly nice home in quantum field theory. It didn't need string theory to make sense of it. Well, that's how we found it. So string theory is very useful. And that perspective was pursued in a series of papers by Kofton and Salman Yaffe uh, about 10 years ago. So an orbifold projection is a systematic algorithm for throwing out the user freedom in a mother theory and constructing some daughter theory. There's a reason you want to do such a thing. Okay? But before I tell you, I mean, you have to first find the symmetry under which stuff that you want to keep is neutral and stuff you want to toss as charge. Okay? <clears throat> and for us, the mother theory is going to be a theory on uh, R3 times S1. And the daughter theory is one where you don't have to circle. Okay? So basically, the circle size is very small. So, so the point is, if you have an overfold projection relating two theories, some other theory and daughter theory, then there's something called overfold equivalence. The statement of overfold equivalence is the following. If the projection symmetry to make the daughter is not spontaneously broken, then correlation functions of neutral operators, that is, ones that surround the projection in the mother theory, coincide with correlation, correlation functions in the daughter theory. Okay? And to see how this applies to this volume of the business that I've been talking about, Consider correlation functions um, of, let's say, Kaluza-Klein neutral operators, so things that don't uh, carry any momentum 
on the compact direction. Okay, so let me call them M. These are neutral operators that they don't not excited in the compact direction. Okay, so at large n, large n counting tells you that <coughs> such correlation functions are saturated by true diagrams. So you have some direct scattering in principle between such states. Then you can have scattering mediated by some intermediate states. You have to sum over the intermediate states that go in there and so on. Okay, so all of those come in order one over n squared. Okay, you take into infinity strictly none of this is there. It's the remark first part of the talk. But if you go to the first leading, first order beyond the large limit, you start getting these things, okay? Now, the daughter theory is defined by throwing out the cocaine balls, essentially. It's throwing out stuff that winds the circle, as they're saying here, okay? So the thing is, there are meson processes possible in the mother theory that has the cocaine balls that are not possible in the daughter. They involve exchange of cocaine balls, okay? But the thing is that, okay, so here's a diagram which comes in order one over n squared. Okay? So you have a neutral hadron, an unneutral hadron, scattering into a KK hadron and going back to two neutral guys. Now, this is not possible so long as this KK number is actually conserved. But if it were possible, we'd be in trouble because this diagram, which is present in the, which would be present in the mother, but not in the daughter, would come with the same order as these diagrams, which are present in both the mother and the daughter. Okay? Now, of course, the mother theory is not equivalent to the daughter theory completely. You can have the KK modes or winding modes come in through loops. Okay, but that's one over n suppressed. Loops here of hadrons, not of quarks and gluons, those are not suppressed. The loops of hadrons are suppressed. Okay? So if n is large and KK number is conserved, then Mesner and Google properties will match between a theory that lives on R3 times a circle and a theory that just essentially lives on R3 in some sense which can be made precise. And then here come Gross and Kitazawa. They have an observation that the KK momenta and the center symmetry is actually tied together, so you need center symmetry to be preserved as well. Okay, so you need no spontaneous translation breaking and center symmetry. Will you say that so uh, yeah. you could remove one dimension and compensate by yeah. color, but if you want to remove two dimensions? You could do it too. In fact, that's what that's what, that's what Iguchi and Kawai first did. Okay, so if you go to a lattice person and you tell them what's Iguchi and Kawai, what they'll tell you is you can practify the theory on T4. Mm -hmm. The theory, I mean, QCD. Yeah. Compactify it on T4, discretize it, and throw away every lattice mm -hmm. site except one in, okay, in each direction. So it's a reduction of the theory living on a four dimensional space down to a zero dimensional matrix model. Okay, so, so that's what, that was the original proposal. Mm -hmm. So infinite number of colors could be one dimension or two or three, depending yeah, exactly, on how you slice exactly, it. Exactly. Speaking. So they, they, they can actually carry mm -hmm. all of the information. But if you want to know more about this, I can tell you later. Mm -hmm. uh, Details are interesting, but for this talk, I don't really want to get into it. Okay, so this is volume independence. Um, now, this is, I don't know whether it sounds cool to you or not, it does to me. But the one question you might be wondering is why haven't you heard about this before? Okay, it sounds like a major thing about gauge state, it doesn't know that you've rectified it. Why is this not famous, or more famous than it really is? And the reason is this, okay? The thing is, if you have a small circle, <coughs> Okay, and you have periodic boundary conditions. There's another name for that. It's called a temperature. And as many of you may know, if you put a theory at very high temperature, a gauge theory, it deconfines. You get a quark gluon plasma instead of hadrons. Okay? Another way to say this is center symmetry actually should break when the circle is small enough. So this won't work for arbitrarily small circle sizes. This happens precisely via condensation of operators carrying winding number, these colonies around the circle. And to see that it does happen, for sure, assume the circle size is very small, compute the perturbative effective potential for the order parameter, the Wilson loop, and you find that it's given by this expression, assuming you have a typo, and you can show that it's minimized when omega is the identity matrix, so the trace of it is n, center symmetry is broken. Okay, so this, what I, what I just wrote is for pure inputs. Okay, this was the original proposal. And perturbation theory is reliable for this calculation, so you can be really sure that center symmetry really does break. So this whole program that I've laid out about independence on L, it's garbage. It doesn't work. Okay? Um, and this was realized actually basically like a month after Iguchi and Kabai was their paper. Okay, so you might wonder why Gross was still working on it several years later while well, people had hope they could fix it. Okay? Because uh, it was very tantalizing. But unfortunately, nobody really fixed it. Okay? This has been a roadblock for about 25 years this issue that you can't really shrink the circle size as much as you want. Okay? The idea is it didn't work. Okay? 
But the reason I'm here giving the talk is that the roadblock was eventually gotten around. So, so this fermionic symmetry preserves this kind of equal spacing, is that? that the, which theory? This fermionic symmetry, will that ah, preserve this equal spacing? This if you want, yes. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will come to that. It's very good. So, so here come Kofton and Sanyaki again in about 2007. What they observed is that, forget Young Mills, let's take you see the adjoint. Let's just play with that. Okay, let's see what happens to center symmetry when the center circle is small in this other theory, which is interesting. By then it was realized this particular theory, which looks pretty random, is actually very interesting for PC. That was the reason they looked at it. So, turns out you compute the same effective potential and you get a very different result. Here's a number of flavors in the theory, and here's how an F comes. So if an F is greater than one, it flips the potential. So what used to be the minimum is now the maximum. So there's some other minimum now. So you go and you look for it, and you discover that the minimum is at a center symmetric point. At least when an F is greater than one. When an F is one, this potential vanishes. That's not an accident. When an F is one, this theory actually has supersymmetry. This is just n equals one in four dimensional supersymmetric fluid dynamics, pure. Okay? In fact, all orders of the potential vanish. However, there are non-perturbative contributions coming from a Winston time to compute them, and they generate a potential that also kind of looks like this, and is minimized also at a center symmetric point. So for any NF equal to or greater than one, center symmetry is actually preserved when the circle size is very small. Okay? And Colton and Salniaki proposed that so the adjoint gives the first and perhaps only working realization of all of these. It may not work in purely mills, but it should work here. Okay? And that implies, in particular, that QCD adroid should have no phase transitions as a function of circumstance. I want to emphasize that it's going to be very important for us in a couple of slides at this point here. But before I proceed, there's a subtlety. The subtlety is that the calculation that often Saliati did, the coupling calculation, is strictly only valid. Yes, yeah. just a quick question on that. Yes. Okay. Um, you just made a comment that L is sort of related to the temperature here. So are you saying that you see the adjoint doesn't have a corporal plasma? Because there's no That's an excellent core. question. It anticipates an issue I will come to in a second. The interpretation of that circle as a temperature is a very subtle one. Okay. It does not work between the adjoint. Okay. We will see why in a second. It is not always true that a circle is the same thing as temperature. Yeah. It is true for pure ring wells. I know you may know this, but it will actually be very important for us in a second. So we're anticipating an important point. But anyway, what, what these guys did, it actually works only in this funny large element I mentioned when the circle size goes like one over n. That's a non atomic large element, and volume evenness doesn't actually apply to it. All that calculation says is that there's no reason to expect the intersymmetry to break. It doesn't prove that it doesn't break at some intermediate value of the circle size. Okay. Excuse me, what do you mean by non atomic large element? So in a atomic large element, you take n to infinity and hold everything else fixed as you take n to infinity. So nothing is going to zero or okay, and except here? n. And here, n goes to infinity and l goes to zero with n. Oh, I see. Okay, so that they need that limit in order to be able to do the recoupling calculation. I should say that you know, it had to be this way if volume inference is right. See, if volume inference is right, and you could do a recoupling calculation by making the circle small, you could solve QCD. Just make the circle small. There's volume inference. If it becomes weakly coupled, you're done. You solve the theory. But it's not that easy, okay? Because you can make the circle as small as you like, but the theory stays strongly coupled until you do that. Okay? I can tell you in detail why that's true if you want. It's actually not so obvious, but, uh, but we can come back to it if you want. Okay? Now, the point is that because of this subtlety, it's a highly suggestive result by Kofi and Saliaki, but it doesn't quite prove what you want to prove. You need to go to some non perturbative method to understand what's going on. And the only available such method for theories on R3 times this one is numerical lattice simulations. Please don't worry, I won't actually show you any plots for lattice simulations. Um, but the simulations in, in question exist. In fact, there are over 10 of them um, in the last several years uh, by various authors. There are many simulations, okay? They're very difficult. But nevertheless, there's one consensus. You see the adjoint on R3 times this one really does have volume independence of R3. That's what these simulations suggest. They check what the center symmetry is preserved and it appears to be. Okay? However, lattice simulations are subtle. It's nice to have another way to check. And indeed, there is one. You can put the theory, instead of R3 times S1, you can put it on a three sphere in other directions. Then, when the three sphere is very small, the theory is weakly coupled for any circle size. 
And moreover, it was shown by uh, Aroni, Marsano, Mubala, and Van Ramsdam in 2003 that the theory still confines in a weakly coupled regime and has a high Lagrange spectrum. And at the same time, it was also it's also known that this theory really does have volume. Okay, so here's a case where everything is watertight. Okay, the theory has volume. Okay? So we know that at least one case where it really does work, and as a high Lagrange spectrum, this will become very important in the next slide. But the point I want to make is there's strong numerical and analytic reasons to believe that this volume independence thing really does apply to UCDF. Okay? But there's a big puzzle, which is the whole point of the talk, which is the following. Large n theory, seven infinite number of stable hadrons. Um, it is widely believed that the number of hadronic states, if you try to count them, um, per mass, is, um, distribution of hadronic states as a function of mass, uh, behaves like this. It grows exponentially. Okay? With some characteristic scale, which is of order lambda QCD, the strong scale of the theory. Okay? It's called the Hagedorn spectrum. And heuristically, it's because you expect very highly excited hadrons to behave like strings, like relativistic strings. And relativistic strings famously have Hagedorn spectrum. They behave exactly like this. Okay? Now, if you look in the particle data book, actually, the experimental results appear to be consistent with this, for whatever that's worth. Um, and actually, recently, there's been some arguments that you can show that this must be the case directly from some large amplitudes of QCD without relying on the kind of strength of the arguments. But for the purpose of this talk, just trust me, large NDH theories have a heavy perspective. That's why they believe in the theory. Okay? So, let's take, in view of that statement, let's take any confining theory, large N theory, and put it on a circle. Okay? Like I've been talking about for the whole talk. Now you compute the partition function. Okay, here it is. Okay, I've written it as an integral over the density of states times the Boltzmann factor. Okay, now the Boltzmann factor is an exponential with a minus sign. I just told you that the partition function has an exponential in it with a plus sign. That's bad. It means that as the temperature drops, as beta, which is one over the circle size, uh, as beta gets uh, larger, okay. uh, eventually this factor beats that one, at which point the, the integral doesn't converge. Okay? So partition function is infinite. So that's very bad. It means that before you hit that point, there had to be a phase transition. Okay? Um, and that phase transition is expected to be precisely the, the, the confinement transition toward the core blue. Notice I said any confining theory. Okay? If, you have, if you have a Hagedorn spectrum, this is going to happen. So doesn't this conflict with the story I've been telling you for the whole rest of the talk? The answer is, of course, no. Because I haven't told you an important thing. Volume independence is only expected if you compactify the theory in a spacious way. So what that means is boundary conditions are very important. For a thermal circle, fermions have to have antiperiodic boundary conditions. If it's a spatial direction, they have to have periodic boundary conditions. With periodic boundary conditions for fermions, the Euclidean, Euclidean path integral does not calculate the thermal partition function. It calculates the twisted partition function with a minus one to the fermion number insertion. Okay? Now, if you have a supersymmetric theory, that's just the wizard index. Okay? But in a non-supersymmetric theory, it's something else, the twisted partition function. And the important thing about this is the way the density of states comes in, it's not positive definite. You get the bosonic density of states coming in, minus the fermionic density of states because of this minus one to the F. Okay? Now, with, with SUSY, this thing, this cancels that, and you just have an independent, independent object. Uh, but when an F is greater than one, this is certainly not an index. Okay? However, it's very different um, from a thermal position function, which has a plus sign. Okay. Now, I should say that <coughs> often, the normal thermal position function and the twisted partition function, while they're technically different, are practically the same. Because uh, the only fermionic states in most theories are baryons, and they're very heavy. So until your temperature is high enough to make baryons, it doesn't matter which kind of amplification you use. But for QCD adjoint, that's very different, because there you can very easily make uh, light fermionic mesons. So uh, the twisted partition function and the thermal partition functions are very different in QCD adjoint uh, from each other. Okay. And because of this minus sign here, you expect some amount of cancellation between the bosonic and fermionic 
tensors of states. So just because this thing blows up doesn't mean that the whole expression blows up. So, sorry, before when you computed yeah. the effective potential, the boundary conditions must have been important. Yes, they were. And, and you used the, these and the periodic ones. I used I used the one appropriate for spatial classification mm -hmm. without telling you. Sorry about that. If I had used anti the, the thermal mm -hmm. boundary conditions, I would have had to confine them. Mm -hmm. Even with adjunct permanence. Nothing can save you from deconfinement if you have thermal boundary conditions. At least nothing that I know about. But with spatial boundary conditions, adjunct permanence might save them. Okay? So, but notice, okay, I had a problem. Um, well, appropriate slide. So suppose we believe only with the and at the same time, suppose you believe that there's high energy scale, and it's going to have to affect both the, both the bosonic and fermionic densities of states. Okay, then to avoid a deconfinement transition, you have to have some kind of cancellation between all of the exponentially growing parts in the bosonic density of states and the fermionic density of states. But the states here are bosons, the states here are fermions. It means you have to have relationships between the spectrum of bosonic and fermionic states. Okay, um, but that requires degeneracies between an infinite number of bosonic and fermionic states at n equals infinity. That's, that has to be a symmetry. What else can it be? You don't have degeneracy between an infinite number of things without a symmetry. Okay? When an f is 1, the symmetry is already known. It's just Susie. But when an f is greater than 1, it has to be something else. Because there are more microscopic fermions and bosons in this theory. So it can't be Susie. And that doesn't conflict with Kuno and Angela for the reason I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. What can it possibly be? But Good question. Chickens. I'm trying but to. Do you know the answer? Uh, in some examples, yes, but not in QCD adjoint. But, but why can't it be Susie just for a part of the bosonic? Because with Susie, you have to have the same number of bosonic degrees of freedom as fermionic ones, except in some very exotic examples in two dimensions. At least, if you know of an example which is not like that, I'd like to know. Well, in the past, people talk about misaligned supersymmetry, yes, very good. something this, like that. This, very good. The, the Keith Dinas and the Rob Myers and so on misaligned supersymmetry. After we wrote this paper, we, we talked to those guys. Mm -hmm. It may be that this whole thing is the field theory realization of misaligned supersymmetry, mm -hmm. wherever that was. But they never had a symmetry argument for what that was. It's misaligned Susie. I think it, from the field theory point of view, it requires a symmetry. Mm -hmm. Come back to that offline. I think it's a field theory realization of misaligned supersymmetry, perhaps. Okay. So, okay, so let me give you some examples of how this bizarre kind of thing might work. Okay, cancellations without Susie. Okay. So, okay, I don't yet know how it works in QCD adjoint directly. I have some ideas, we can talk about it offline, not on camera, because I'm still working on it. Um, so, let's take an instructive ultra simplified toy model for quantum mechanics. One bosonic oscillator and a fermionic oscillator with the same excitation. Okay, omega. I dropped zero point energies because they're not so important. Okay, but you could put them in the floor. So when you have only one flavor of fermionic oscillator, bosonic, uh, sorry, yeah, fermionic oscillator, then you have a supersymmetry in the system. Okay, here's a supercharge. It's just a free supersymmetric theory. Okay, this Q commutes with the Hamiltonian. When you have more than one fermionic uh, uh, set of oscillators, you have more supercharges. They all commute with the Hamiltonian. It's a free theory. It's allowed. Okay, but what implication does it have? So, issues of time. Maybe I won't go into this in great detail, but with SUSY, if you go and compute the twisted partition function, you find that you get a contribution from the ground state of all the oscillators, and then all of the ex excited levels of the bosonic and fermionic oscillators, they all cancel each other in the twisted partition function. Yeah. Uh, shouldn't you have BF dagger? I mean, shouldn't Q with Q dagger give Hamiltonian? I mean, on the previous slide, why did you call it? Uh, it was linear, I mean. Shouldn't that? Oh, sorry. It was, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. It's a commutator. Oh, okay. Symmetry means it can use it. Right? By definition, the symmetry has to be. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I, I didn't mean anti commutator. But Q is okay. Q is Q that I mean. The, the Q is with the Q is. No. No. Huh? What is Q I with Q I? Q J. Oh, Q I with Q J is is not just the Hamiltonian. It involves other things. It involves flavor generators. It's a, it's a known algebra. If, if you want, it's a known algebra in this case. Yeah. It's an SU1 slash NF algebra. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I can tell you some references. It's a bigger algebra. Hamilton it's a bigger algebra. A, it's a special element in that algebra. It's a special algebra. element, and it involves some flavor generators as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So why do you say not SUSY then? I would say SUSY. Yeah, it's a super algebra. It's not just space-time. Uh, That's what In this particular me. example, we know the algebra, and OK. Good luck finding an example of that that, that involves one array. 
Yeah. Is that, that's a yeah. Over here, they don't know. What is it? OSP2 slash N or something? In this quantum mechanics example, yeah. I think that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the SU NB slash mm -hmm. NF, okay, where NB is number of bosons. But mm -hmm. in four dimensional quantum field theory, like I said, I have guesses, but I don't really know. Okay, let's hold that thought, okay? So the point is, with SUSY, all of the contributions of excited states or two-sets partition function cancel, as they must because it's a Witten index. Yes. So you're saying there is a super algebra, it's not a space-time super algebra. Yeah, yeah, that's in all. this case it's not yeah. a space-time okay. super mm -hmm. Yeah, Good. if you want, yeah. But also, there's no space-time here, it's a quantum time. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now you go and compute the NF equals two to a certain partition function, and I won't go through it, even though it's very easy because I'm running out of time. But you can show that uh, there are cancellations, they, do, they just don't start at the first excited level. So this part doesn't cancel, but everything from excitation level two and above cancels. It's not Susie. Okay, it works differently. Okay. So in fact, you can formalize it with NF equal one, where you have supersymmetry. Um, the states in the box all cancel each other, and only the states in the cohomology of the operator Q contribute to the supersymmetry function. That's just a vacuum. Um, with NF equals two, which is not supersymmetry, at least in the way I would. Um, again, the states in the box, the NA contributions that cancel each other from the twisted partition function, okay? And only the states in the cohomology of all of the QIs make contributions, and that's a, some finite number of states, including some excited states. It acts rather differently than Susie normally does, okay? Cancellations there are normal. okay? So this is just to illustrate that cancellations in a twisted partition function can happen even without supersymmetry, but you do need a fermatic symmetry. So, of course, that example did not have a Hagedorn spectrum. So are there examples where I can do the same game, which do have a Hagedorn spectrum, and see whether there's a cancellation? The answer is yes. Um, we can consider a model inspired by the fumes of string theory. I don't mean to take it seriously as a string theory. It's just a toy model, okay? So you consider a model which has a spectrum uh, of energy squared defined to be n divided by some string tension, like object, and n is something. It's basically an infinite number of oscillators. Generalization of the previous example. I have an infinite number of bosonic oscillators with integer space frequencies and an infinite number of fermionic oscillators also with integer space frequencies. Okay? But there's an F of them. Okay, so it's not supersymmetric. The point of illustrating this model is only to illustrate a point of principle. We're going to see that here the Hamidon growth can cancel even without supersymmetry, even when an F is not one. So do you have some Vera Soro constraints or? No, it's just. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't view this as coming from any kind of world sheet or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I just mean my model is <laughs> these two lines together, that's it. I don't ask where it came from. Of course, if you look in a string theory book, it probably came from something like that. But for my purposes, that's not so important. It's just an example of, of something which has a spectrum of the sort that I want. I want to study how it plays with itself. Okay. Um, so if you want to ask, um, how how does the number of degree how how is the number of excited states scale with the excitation level? You can play the usual games with defining combinatorial generating functions, um, states, either all with the same sign for the thermal partition function, or with opposite signs for both the Fermi's for the twisted one. <coughs> you go through the games and you discover that in the thermal case, indeed, the density of states uh, has a Hagedorn growth. It's, it came it, it was stolen from Green Schwartz Okay, of course it had to. It's really some kind of string theory. Okay? Some kind of sort of string theory. Okay? But the more interesting thing is what happens if if you have the twisted partition function, if you count bosonic and fermionic states with opposite signs. Again, you count the states, and you discover that when an F is one, of course it's a complete cancellation, only the vacuum contributes. But when an F is greater than one, so you don't have supersymmetry, at least not any kind of normal supersymmetry. Uh, the density of states does not grow exponentially with, with large excitation level. It, it doesn't actually grow at all. The mismatch between the number of bosonic and fermionic states is either plus one, minus one, or just zero. Okay, the, the non-vanishing entries here are the generalized pentagonal numbers for whatever that is worth. Okay? So, yeah, you can show that there is no Hagedorn growth here. Okay? You, can balance, you can make some balance, the, 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 not the coefficient here can be balanced by a power law. No Hagedorn, no exponential growth. But why? And of course, the reason is a fermionic symmetry, which is not supersymmetry. 
at least not as used. So here's a supercharge it can use with the object that I wrote earlier. And it turns out that it links all the states to each other. And it's behind the cancellations. Now, it was possible to play this game only because the video was free. Of course, so as you see the address in large n in terms of the physical um, Now, what what that means is that even though the thermal gamification of this toy model only makes sense up to some temperature, which is the Hagedorn temperature, and after that it makes no sense because the theory is deconfined, this one makes sense for any spatial surface. Yes. The lesson is that models with Hagedorn spectra for bosonic and chromatic states can have sub-exponential bounded twisted densities of states even without it. Now, of course, the big question, what is this for the symmetry in the gauge theory? And I don't know. Okay? A nightmare scenario for me is if it is an emergent infrared symmetry of some sort, which looks non local from the unique point of view. Such things have happened before in my field, okay? for instance, cyber is an example, I think. Okay? And it's very hard to find such emergent infrared symmetries without the magic of supersymmetry. Okay? But the puzzle that I've posed okay, uh, between Hagedorn and Bonnie events, it exists even in a weekly couple setting. So I think it's actually pretty hard to envision this, this picture. I think there should be a description of the symmetry in terms of the quarks and gluons, in, in principle. And the stakes are very high, because if you examine the proof of the Hart-Kudrasky-Sonius theorem, it, I think it strongly suggests that if such a symmetry is there, then demanding that it close will require you to introduce um, conserved currents with spin higher than two. So if this symmetry is there, actually even more should be there because of this theorem. Um, and you know that means there would be a lot of symmetry in this QCD lake theory, and that would be very powerful. But we have to do more work to see that that's true. Probably not. Okay. So let me let me summarize and stop. Okay. So I've been talking about a theory, QCD adjoint, which may look unfamiliar, but it actually has an intimate connection to QCD. And um, what I've tried to argue is that if this theory, large and QCD adjoint, has both the Hagedorn spectrum and large and volume events, and have given some evidence for both, it should apparently have an emergent fermionic symmetry at large end to make these two properties consistent with each other. I don't see any other way for, for, for them to be consistent. Um, in my view, this is the first theoretically interesting consequence of volume events, because in the past, it's only been used to try to save numerical costs of lattice gauge theory simulations, make the lattice small is cheaper. Okay, but that's nice, but in this is, if it's correct, Maybe a little bit more exciting. Um, of course, the lattice people are continuing to look at volume events. Um, they've never looked at for spectral degenerates. They've never had reason to. They should. They will find them. I think the big question is whether we can find the microscopic realization of the symmetry, because that's what would make this very powerful if it can be done, which is not obvious. Um, and there's a lot of motivation for it, because fermionic symmetries in general have been extremely useful to us in cases where we have them. So if these if this kind of non susy fermionic symmetry actually exists, you might wonder what you can do with it. So let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, here, here you constructed a model that had a uh, fermionic symmetry. It's not mm -hmm. symmetry, it's based on, but it has a fermionic symmetry. And it implies this cancellation of, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I don't see really why, in the opposite direction, I mean, suppose it is finite. This, this partition function. Why does there have to be a fermionic symmetry? I mean, do you have because proof? Because for it to be... No, no, yeah, it's possible, proof, but do you have proof? proof? I mean, should, so should, when you say should I have... I can give you an argument. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if, if this twisted partition function mm -hmm. is going to remain finite for all values of L, mm -hmm. the only way it can happen is if there are cancellations between the bosonic. Sure. Yeah. Okay? But you need a cancellation between a, not just one or two states, but like many. Mm -hmm. So that means there have to be spectral degeneracies between many bosonic and fermionic states. Mm -hmm. So you could define an operator that sends the fermions to the bosons, and that by, would, by definition, be your charge. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what you need. Okay, that's, yeah. that's what I mean by symmetry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. You need a you need some okay. uh, some operator, mm -hmm. some some charge, mm -hmm. which can use with the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. which maps bosons to fermions okay. in the appropriate way, to allow that to, to allow those degeneracies to be present. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is this has to happen in a in a theory which is on the one hand Poincaré invariant. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, can't possibly have supersymmetry because it's just outside the class of things to which supersymmetry could apply. So it has to be something more, and it's only conceivable because I'm talking about merging. Otherwise, of course, it would be crazy. 
So, yeah, yeah. Can you say that you can actually write down algebra abstractly anyway, yeah. but you don't know how to realize it in a pure theory, interacting but, but, theory? Do you have an algebra you can write no, down? No, not yet, work? because uh, to even write down the algebra, I need to first write down the, the trend. I need to find transformations of the of the fields in the adjoint that actually leave the Lagrangian invariant. Then I need to start co considering commutators and anti-commutators of those field transformations to figure out what the algebra would have to be. Since I don't know how, how to do step one yet, well, we're working on it. I can tell you offline about our current stage. Uh, I don't know the answer to it, to, to what, what algebra is. And I have no idea. It's an open question. Yeah. I mean, I mean, those charges at the head look very much like what they have in one, you know, in a one, two, one plus one dimensional field theory. I mean, like, can't I just build fields from, you know, Z to the N, you know, B, N. You mean uh, these charges? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it looks like if I take sum over N, A dagger N, Z yeah. to the minus N, I call it, you know, symplectic boson, and then, you yeah. know, affirm and so on. So it looks like almost standard stuff in two-dimensional CFT constructions. You cannot write the field theorem about this one. Perhaps, at least I'm not as familiar with the CFT as I should be. And for, 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 for me, the challenge was always to, to, to figure out what the analog of this would have to be in the 40 gauge theory. Mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, maybe there's some, by the way, I should say, I mean, there may be analogs of this kind of phenomenon in, in theories beyond the one I've talked about. In fact, there's reason to believe that. It's a two-dimensional theory in the true. But, but that's interesting, but that, 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 that wasn't what I've been focused on just because of my own background. I, I, I was really tantalized by trying to find something mm -hmm. that you see. But it may be true about the else we have to find. Getting back to my question earlier, <coughs> um, how do you think they use the QCD adjoint and regular QCD if they, in your arguments, they're going to have different phase structures now? They have I mean, the same phase structure at many temperatures. If I take finite temperature domestication with anti periodic boundary conditions for fermions, they both have a decent finite temperature. Okay. The issue comes if you the take this other one. Take up those types of phase transitions. You see, you see that there was a. I, 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 in, the, in the interest of time, I didn't emphasize this. I just flashed it without actually even saying it verbally. Uh, see, this connection between the two theories. You know what? Notice how I said R4? Yeah. There. there was a reason for that. Okay. Because if you if you if you consider these spatial quantifications, then exactly the, the issue that you worry about comes up. One theory deconfines, the other one doesn't, yeah. on, on this spatial quantification. And what happens is there's a there's some conditions for this orbital balloons to hold. And they have to do with the realization of uh, charge conjugation symmetry. And that charge conjugation symmetry also breaks if you have center symmetry right here. Okay. So even the connection between these things breaks down. But it, it, at, at large L, they are tied to each other. And if one, so essentially, if you have, uh, here's uh, normal QCD, here's QCD adjoint. Okay, so normal QCD has a phase transition when, when the circle size is small enough. Okay. Uh, this theory doesn't when the circle size is large. Well, this one doesn't for any circle size. So, in equivalence, so what you want to know ultimately, right? At least what I want to know, yeah. is what is the behavior of QCD on R4? Okay, because that's relevant yeah. to the real world. Yeah. So the point is that if you know stuff about how this theory behaves down here, for instance, that actually tells you about that. Yeah, stuff that's the point. Way. But not the other way around. Yeah. But okay, fine. But it doesn't tell you also on, at all sizes. It doesn't tell you about the behavior at all sizes. So if you want to know is some stuff about this this regime, then there's no reason to study that. That's also interesting, of course, yeah, but, okay. but but again, the large yeah, you have the to world is still the large exactly, exactly. You know, like, at least that you know now yeah. after the big bang announced. Yeah. 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 Uh, so does this volume of pedals say something about it? Uh, so you, sort of. So uh, a equals four super n mills. Um, you compactify it on a circle. Uh, it has a moduli space for the, uh, I said, for the eigenvalues of that Wolfson loop operator that I've been talking about. So in the key theories I've talked about, it's dynamically determined, you don't get to choose it. Okay, but in n equals four, there's actually a moduli space for it. It's up to you. So if, if in n equals four superannuals theory, which has a gravity, 
you, you go sit on the point in moduli space where they're evenly spaced. You can see that the theory is volume dependent. And you can see it in either in field theory, if it's weakly coupled, you can just play with it. Or you can go to ABS CFT. And in ABS CFT, you can ask what does it mean to have equally spaced eigenvalues? It has to do with some positions of V2 brains, obviously some T duality on, on the circle. And again, you can see that there's volume dependence from ABS CFT. There's a nice paper on this by Rita uh, Tunsal and Eric Poppets uh, from maybe three or four years ago. So ADS CFT is consistent for it, so it doesn't really say that much about it, but it's consistent. Yeah. If you think of ADS as a box, roughly speaking, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, finite size, roughly box, speaking, yeah. but do you think of volume independence in ADS theory with gravity? Uh, uh, no. At least I don't know how to do it because the ADS so direction is not compact. Well, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, it it's works like a box. I mean, you have a discrete spectrum in ADS. So if you can tell and me. And you take the radius to zero limit, let's say, of ADS, you would have a large volume. I haven't thought about it. But I mean, in principle, can, could you can have you, a theory? Can you, can you see, in the gauge theory, it doesn't make any sense to think about wrapping a, a Wilson line on, on the ADS Because direction. string theory in large cosmological constant limits still is kind of well behaved. You have string excitations. Yeah, I'm not saying yeah. there's anything wrong with it. It's just mm -hmm. that that direction is not a field theory direction. So, mm -hmm. so it would. So independence on the size of the of ADS box would mean what? Independence on the RP scale? Does that, does that just mean it's a CFD? I, I'm, I'm not sure. I've never thought about it that just because it's not a field theory direction. So it's mm. a different question. Let's continue questions upstairs and then I see you.